Hey, and I'm recording you guys today because my period three class never answers any questions. And while well, it's interrupted by the assembly in the middle, so it's your time to shine. It's a big opportunity here. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to go over today is, is hopefully going to be review from Science 10. Okay, you went over position versus time graphs in Science 10. Okay? You did calculations, interpretation, inference, and all that kind of stuff with those graphs. So hopefully this all seems familiar. Okay? We really don't do much new with position time graphs in Physics 20. Okay? All right, so the key points for today, we need to understand what information can be read from kinematics graphs today in particular, position time, okay? Uh, we need to understand that graphs and equations, uh, they show uh, the same information, but in different ways. So even that two-part question we just did on the quiz, that we could easily have drawn a position versus time graph for and asked exactly the same things, okay? And you would have calculated them in basically the same way. Last point, learn that kinematics equations are derived from graphing. A lot of the formulas that are on your formula sheet are actually graphing calculations from various types of graphs that we will go over in this course. Okay. Now, back in Science 10, you did position versus time and velocity versus time graphs in the physics unit. Those are the only two graphs you had to know anything about in Science 10. And probably a lot of you just memorized everything about them. Okay which was fine, you only had two graphs. Well, by the time you get done physics 20, you're going to have about a dozen different graphs that you're going to work with regularly. And in physics 30, that number will go up to about three dozen graphs that you will work with regularly. So there will be no memorizing of every little thing on every graph you deal with. Okay? If you, I don't want you to memorize what the slope represents on all three dozen graphs that you're going to have to know. You'll probably get it mixed up. What we want you to do instead is have the skills necessary to interpret each and every graph you encounter. Okay? With that skill, you can figure out what the slope on a particular graph represents, okay? or what the area under a line represents, or whatever, just by looking at that particular graph and doing the interpretation instead. All right? So that's kind of what we're going to focus on today. Okay? All right. On a position versus time graph, what can I read directly off of a position versus time graph? It's not a trick question. How far they move. Okay, I can calculate how far they move. That is one of the things I can calculate off of that graph. What are the two things I can read directly without having to do anything? The position and the time. The position and the time. Like I said, it wasn't a trick question. Okay? It's a position time graph. It's showing where the object is at various points in time. And from that, I can calculate how far it goes. I can calculate its overall displacement. I can calculate its average speed, average velocity. Okay? There's lots of things I can calculate off of that graph. But the only two things I can read directly are what's on the y-axis and what's on the x-axis, position and time. Okay? So if I am looking at this graph here, Okay. It'll tell me where this train is at various points in time. The shape of the graph can allow me to infer or interpret the type of motion that the train is undergoing. Right? And from there, I can calculate how far the train travels, how fast the train is going, okay, and things like that. So at the start of this graph, we have the graph being just a diagonal line, okay? And the graph, the picture says, it's traveling at a uniform velocity of 180 kilometers per hour. So this is one of those European bullet trains, okay? That goes really, really fast. Uh, how do I know that on this graph, that diagonal line means that it's traveling at a constant velocity? By the way, the um line goes up and down because it's all uniform. Because it's uniform, exactly. Okay? Because that line is diagonal, it's telling me that the amount the y-axis changes is the same for every interval on the x-axis. Right? So if I was able to draw on here you know, intervals of time that were equal, 
Okay? I would see that the change in y is the same for both of those equal changes in x, except that I draw a terrible and didn't look that way. Okay? Does everyone follow me on that? That's true for any graph. Okay? If any graph is diagonal, it means that there's a constant rate of change of y over x. On this graph, it means a constant change of position or displacement over time. What does displacement over time calculate? Velocity. velocity. So the velocity is constant because those two ch things change by the same amount every second. Okay? So that's an interpretation thing. We don't have to memorize it. Oh, that's, if this is going on, that's what it means. I can just interpret that each time. I can go, okay, what's on the y-axis? Position. Okay, what's on the x-axis? Time. All right, when position changes at a constant rate, the definition of velocity is a change in position over time. Oh, it must represent velocity. I don't have to memorize what the graph means. I have to memorize what the definition of velocity is, sure. Okay? But I can apply that to this graph. Okay, in the next part, they have this word, which in physics we don't like. We don't use the word decelerate in physics. Okay? There is only acceleration in physics. It can be positive or negative. Okay, but we don't generally say decelerate. Right? Certainly this part of the graph does show an object that is undergoing a negative acceleration. In this case, it is slowing down. Right? How do I know that here the object is slowing down? Because the angle at which the graph is moving is becoming more uh, flat. Exactly. The line's getting flat. If we just looked at this diagonal line and said it was traveling at a constant velocity, okay, then the steepness of the line must represent how fast it's going. If this line is getting flatter and flatter and flatter, that means that every time interval, it doesn't go as far. So if I do a couple of equal time intervals, as best I can here, I didn't do a very good job. Okay, um, That one's way longer. Let me try that again. Okay, so these two lines are close to the same, but the vertical parts are shorter. Okay, every equal time interval, it doesn't go as far. Everybody follow me there? Okay, that means it must be slowing down. The only reason I wouldn't go as far in an equal amount of time is if I'm going slower. Okay, again, I don't have to memorize what that means on a graph. I can just look at the graph and interpret that. All right, after 0.3 hours, the line is flat. Any, lab, any graph has a flat line, then whatever's on the y-axis is yes, stopped or isn't changing. In this case, it actually literally means stopped because on the y-axis is position. If the position isn't changing, it's because we're stopped. Okay? But if I was looking at a velocity versus time graph and it was flat, it wouldn't mean the object was stopped. It would mean the object was traveling at constant velocity. It just means that whatever's on the y-axis isn't changing. Okay? So it doesn't matter what graph it is, if it's a horizontal flat line, whatever's on the y is constant. Okay? We're not changing. Alright, so in this case, the train is stopped at the station. Okay? For 0.2 hours. Alright, then we have this part of the graph, where the line goes up. It curves upwards, and it says it's accelerating, and it is. It's accelerating positively. Okay? How does that upward curve tell me that the object is accelerating? It's the same reasoning we used here. Okay? In this first 0.1 hours of its motion, it only changed its position by that much. But in the next 0.1 hours, it changed its position by this much. Okay? Did it go further? Went further in the same amount of time. Only way we do that is if we're going faster. So we're accelerating. Okay? And all I have to do, I don't have to memorize anything. I just have to look at the graph. Okay? And say, what's on the graph? What's changing? How is it changing? And then I can arrive at those conclusions. Okay? All right, and then at the end of this graph, we got a diagonal line again, okay? which means the object is now 
changing its position at a constant rate, which means traveling at a constant velocity. All right. What if I asked you, what is the displacement of this train between, um, let's say, um, what's a good one to use here, between point 0.1 hours and point 0.8 hours. So you can see where those lines go. Okay. What's the total displacement of the train between 0.1 and 0.8 hours? You're going to use the same formula we used on the uh, Inukshuk question from the first day. Thirty-six kilometers looks good to me. Yeah. Okay. I would say it's thirty-six kilometers. All right. Now, how did I know to use that formula? Well, because the um, since it's a, since it's a chart, it can't really go back because it's using time as a since time is a scalar quantity, you can't really go back and forth. Yeah. No. I so. for displacement, and the only two things I have are time, which is kind of irrelevant for what we were doing, and what was the other thing on this graph? Position. position. So if I know I'm looking for displacement, and I really only have position to get it from, all I have to do is look at my formula sheet and go, oh, how do I get position? How do I get displacement if all I have is position and time? Okay? All right, so my initial position was negative 16 meters. My final position or sorry, with negative 16 kilometers. And my final position was positive 20 kilometers. So all I did was go 20 minus negative 16, which gives me positive 36 kilometers. Okay? You probably got asked to do that in Science 10. If you were in my class, you definitely did. All right, everybody okay with that? All right, now that I have that number, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. What's the average velocity for the same time period? between 0.1 and 0.8 hours. sheet tells me that velocity is displacement divided by time. Do I have both of those numbers? I just did all the work to find D. Okay? 36 meters, 36 kilometers. Okay? And time, well, I go from 0.1 to 0.8 hours, that's 0.7 hours. Right? So if I go uh, 36, positive 36, divided by 0.7, okay? that seems like that should give me 5 point something. Right? What was it? 5 point? Um, I got it. Uh, yeah, 5.1. 5.1? Positive 5.1, um, and it would be kilometers in this case per hour. Yeah? Did I mess it up? Oh, okay. Here, we'll double check. It'll be 51. 51, yes, sorry, but that's, yes, 51. Okay. So, 50, positive 51 kilometers per hour. Now, 
Um, oh yeah, because I made the de that's my fault. I made the decimal really, really small there. It's 0.7, not 7. Okay. Uh, all right. Does that seem very fast for a bullet train that was previously going 180 kilometers per hour? Doesn't seem very fast, but it's right because what was it doing for 0.2 of those 0.7 hours? Stop. Stop. We included that part in that calculation. That really affects okay, the overall velocity. Because for 0.2 hours of 0.7 hours, it was just sitting there. All right, questions on how that worked? Okay. So it's entirely possible to get a graph that has a bunch of different parts on it. This is just like the two-part question you did on your quiz. It's just from a graph instead. Okay. I ask you exactly the same things. What's displacement? What's velocity? Calculate the average speed. Calculate the total distance. All of those things can be done from a graph as well. All right, so let's look at something you would have done in both Math 10 and Science 10, slope calculations. Okay, you calculate the slope of all graphs in exactly the same way if they have one single linear function like this. Okay, you can, well, actually, there's two ways, but okay, um, you can do it this way. Slope is d2 minus d1. Basically, this is x or y, sorry, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is basically rise over run. Okay, does that sound familiar? Okay, and while that will calculate slope, that's really about all it's good for. Okay, in physics, we really don't use that formula very much. We like this one better. So that formula will also calculate slope but it will also tell me y values, x values, and the y-intercept, okay? Which the other one can do, but it's a lot more cumbersome, okay? In this formula, if I'm looking at this formula for this graph, okay? If I choose this point right here, this would be y. This would be x. What's this? Right, which is what part of that formula? B. Right, and what's M represent then? The slope, right. M is the slope of this line. All right. Yesterday, we used this formula as an exercise for algebra, right? And I made you manipulate it for M, knowing that today I would make you do that again. All right, so let's just quickly look at, if I manipulate this equation for M, I'm going to subtract B over to this side. and then divide both sides by x, okay? So if I look at that formula there, is it similar to this formula? It's exactly the same, actually, okay? All we're saying is take this y value, this is y2, take this value, it's essentially y1, okay? I subtract them, that's what I'm doing here, and then I divide it by x. Okay, well, this is essentially x2, but b happens when x is 0, right? That's why that formula and that formula are the same thing, okay? We're just using the y-intercept because at the y-intercept, x is 0. All right, on this graph, which is a position versus time graph, time in seconds here. If I calculate the slope of that line, what does its slope represent? The acceleration of objects. Uh, if it was a velocity time graph, yes, it would be acceleration. This is a position time graph, so it represents something else. Yeah, velocity, but it could also be speed. Yeah, because it's, it's all one direction, okay? How do we know that? I mean, because probably in science 10 you memorize that, okay? But I don't want to have to memorize so many graphs. So what I do instead is I look at what's on this graph. What's on the y-axis of this graph? Position. Okay, so that means then that this y value is my final position. 
and B is my position at time zero, meaning it's my initial position. And what's on the x-axis? Time. Well, isn't that that formula? Okay, does that make sense? Right. That, I can do that for any graph. Okay, we just had we just, we're just saying on a velocity time graph, the slope represents the acceleration. Because if this was a velocity versus time graph, the slope would be v f minus v i over t. Which calculates acceleration. And it's still y minus b over x, okay? but it calculates acceleration. Every graph slope represents something different, but it isn't hard to figure out what it does represent. Okay? All right, so over the next few days, okay, we're going to use that formula quite a bit. Okay? We're going to do lots of graphing stuff, sometimes using y equals mx plus b, and sometimes using graphs that are more random. Okay? But we are going to be moving toward the lab next Thursday. Okay, so a week from today, we'll do a lab with uh, just some electronic data carts, okay? and we'll just get a movement at a constant velocity, and we'll be using y equals mx plus b to determine some stuff about them. Okay? So that's what we're kind of moving towards. <coughs> All right, let's have a look at this graph here. Okay? So we're back again to a position versus time graph. Right? This is something I would totally ask of you, okay, on a quiz or a test or something like that. What is the object doing in part A? It's traveling at a constant velocity. Traveling at a constant velocity. Okay, our knee-jerk reaction as soon as we see a diagonal line accelerating, we see something moving upwards. Okay, remember this is a position versus time graph. Okay? And the position is changing at a constant rate in A. Okay? We know that because if we divided this up into the two seconds that are there, okay, during the first second, it would go this far. During the second second, it would go the same distance. Except clear, I can't draw. I keep screwing that part up. Okay? But this is showing an object changing its position at a constant rate. In other words, traveling forwards or in a positive direction at a constant velocity. Okay. What's going on in part B? It's stopped. Okay. It's stopped because its position is not changing. In fact, we could also be even more specific and we could say it is stopped at a position of six. positive six meters. Okay. What's it doing in C? Going backwards at a constant velocity. Going backwards at a constant velocity. Okay? Because again, it's diagonal. There's no curve here. It's the rate at which it's changing its position is constant or uniform. What's going on in part D? Stopped again. Okay? Stopped at a position of negative 10 meters. All right. In part E and part F, the motion is similar. Okay? What's it doing in both of those parts? Right, traveling at a constant velocity in a forwards direction because it's going from negative 10 back to zero. In which part, E or F, is it going faster? E. Yeah. Because it's steeper and slower. Because it's steeper. We just talked about how the slope of a position time graph represents velocity. Anywhere where it's steepest would be where it's also going fastest. Okay? All of that stuff, we don't have to memorize. We can just interpret and infer. Now I'm going to make you do a little bit more thinking. This one's easy. If the whole trip takes 18 seconds, so the graph ends at 18 seconds, what is the total displacement of this object? Six meters. Right? What's our initial position? Zero. What's our final position? Zero. Okay. Now, it went all over the place, right? It, it went forwards, it went backwards, but in the end, it came back to where it started. So its overall displacement is zero. Okay, here's another easy one. What's the average velocity over 18 seconds? Zero. Yeah. Velocity is displacement divided by time, and we just established the displacement was zero. Okay, zero divided by anything is zero. All right, 
This one you'll have to maybe write a couple things down. What is the total distance traveled by this object? Remember, distance is scalar. Doesn't, direction doesn't matter. Somebody give me an answer. 32 meters. 32 meters. Okay, here's how we figured that out. In part A, we started a position of zero and moved to a position of six meters. How far did we go? Six meters. Okay, how far did we go in part B? Right, didn't go anywhere in part B. So similarly, we also didn't go anywhere in part D. Okay, in part C, we start at positive six meters and go to negative 10 meters. How far did we go? 16 meters, okay? And then we go from negative 10 back to zero. So that's 10. All right, 10 plus 16 is 26, plus six is 32, okay? I still did final position minus initial position, but I did it for each part of the graph and never recorded whether it was forward or backward because it didn't matter, okay? Distance is a scalar quantity. It just keeps getting bigger, okay? All right, follow-up question. The whole trip takes 18 seconds. What's the average speed? Yes. One point, yeah, I think it's yeah, 1.78, 1 1.8, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so we got speed equals total distance divided by total time. And we just did the total distance is 32 meters. Okay? We said the whole trip takes 18 seconds. Okay? 32 over uh, 18, yeah, 1.8. 1.8 meters per second. That, oh, sorry, it's average speed. No, no vector on that. Okay? 1.8 meters per second. Yeah. Okay. Everybody all right with that? I get that actually was one of my science tenants quizzes last year, that same graph. I don't know if you guys remember that. All right, so there's nothing, we haven't done anything new yet, okay? This is still kind of the review of the position time graph stuff from science 10. And in fact, we don't really get any more complex than what you did okay, in science 10. It's gonna be all basically the same stuff. All right, I'm gonna give you guys about a five minute break, okay? Within the classroom here. All right, uh, it's 3 o'clock. We're going to pick up with that graph. So if we're looking at this graph here, okay, we're still looking at a position versus time graph. Okay, so we got position on the y, we got time on the x-axis. All right, but this graph is all curves. So what's going on in this first part of the graph where the curve goes like this. Accelerated. Yeah, it's accelerating. Okay? Because over each time interval, okay, the object goes further. That is, it changes its position more and more and more. Okay? You can see that my vertical lines are getting longer and longer okay, for each one of those time intervals. And the only way we change our position by a larger amount is if we're going faster. Everyone okay with that? All right. Now, after that point, or after this point right here, the line starts to do something different. Okay? It starts to get slower. slower. Yeah. It starts to get flatter. Right? So very quickly after this point, the line just flattens out at the top there. Okay? And then Right after that, it does the exact opposite and gets really, really steep till about here. And then, what does it do here? It starts getting slower. Yeah, it starts getting flatter again. Okay, so in every part of this graph, the object is accelerating then, would you agree? Yeah, because every part of it is curved. There's no part of this graph that's uniform. 
Okay? There's no diagonal parts that say the position is changing by the same amount for every time interval. Okay, so in the first part it's speeding up, and then it slows down to a stop, and then it speeds up really quickly, and then it slows down again. What is this a graph of? Throwing something. Throwing something straight up in the air. Okay, I'm not going to throw that in because I only have one of those. Okay. If I throw this marker up in the air, during the first part, I'm making it go really fast, and then I'm not catching it. Okay, so during the first part, I'm speeding it up. Right? Starts from rest down here, and I throw it up in the air. So I make it go faster and faster and faster. As soon as it leaves my hand, what's acting on it? Gravity. gravity. What does gravity want to do to it? Right, wants to pull it down. So once it leaves my hand, gravity starts to pull it down, which means it slows down, slows down, slows down, comes to a stop for an instant at its maximum height before gravity once again starts to accelerate, this time in a downward direction. Okay? But gravity's acceleration is always what number? 9.81. Whether the object is moving up or down, the acceleration due to gravity is the same which is why both sides of this graph are mirror images of each other. It's undergoing acceleration due to gravity on both sides of that. Okay? So the two sides look the same. Okay? Even though for one part it's going up, and for the other part it's going down. That last part is the part I fail on. Okay? I chuck it up in the air, it does its thing, and then I catch it, and it stops. Okay? So this is me catching it and slowing it down Okay. I would never ask a question like that on a test because that's brutally unfair. Okay. Okay. Say, hey, here's a graph. Tell me what's happening. Okay. I would never ask you like, exactly what was happening, but I could legitimately ask you to describe the motion in each part. Okay. And that would be, in part A, the object is accelerating positively. That is, it is increasing its velocity in a positive direction. Okay. Here, it's moving in a positive direction, but it's slowing down. Here, it's moving in a negative direction and speeding up, and here it's moving in a negative direction but slowing down. Okay? That I could ask you, that would be a fair question. Okay? But to say, what's going on in this graph? Well, a lot of things could look kind of like that. Okay? Um, if I threw a ball, a rubber ball against a wall, it would also look similar to that. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? Right? Like I would accelerate it and then it would hit the wall and slow down while the ball deforms against the wall and then it would shoot off the wall in the other direction. Okay, then I'd get that kind of bell curve there on the top again and then I would catch it. Okay, it would look kind of similar to that. All right? Okay. Now, something we don't ask you to do very much anymore, okay, but you still kind of have to understand is you could be asked about instantaneous velocity. Okay, so what they're saying, if they say, what's the instantaneous velocity at point A, so like right here, okay, that can be a bit tricky because what's the object doing during that part of the graph? It's accelerating, which means its velocity is always changing. So how am I supposed to know how fast it's going right at that point in time? I can't use V equals D over T. It's not a very big length of time. And if I use it for the whole section, it's only telling me the average velocity between like 0 and, and 11 seconds. Okay? So it doesn't really do a, a, a good job of that. It wants to know how fast it's going at exactly that moment. Is it changing the velocity by changing time? OK, that would give me the acceleration, which could be valuable. Okay? But it won't tell me the instantaneous velocity. Okay? So, in order to get the instantaneous velocity, you have to understand the only thing I understood in university calculus. Unfortunately, it was the first day. I never understood a thing after that. Okay? I passed because I memorized the examples in the textbook and I wrote them down on the final exam and got part marks for method. And the course was graded on the curve. You want to know what that means? On the curve? So it means you don't have to pass to pass. As long as you do better than more than half of the people, you pass. I surfed the curve many times in university. I also got crushed by the wave a couple of times. Okay? Like you take psychology and you get 92 and you get four out of nine. Okay? Because more than half the class got 98. Okay? So it doesn't really matter how well you do, it's about how well everybody else does. 
Okay? So um, that first day, my prof explained that to a mathematician, a curve is an infinitely large number of infinitely small straight lines, okay? all strung together. So when a mathematician looks at this picture, they don't see a smooth curve. They see like a pixelated picture of it, okay? where they can actually see all the individual straight parts that are locked together in this curve. Okay, so imagine they see it. We see, we're seeing it in high definition. They're, they're looking at it in low resolution, and they can see all the little jagged edges. Okay? That means, then, that at this point, there's a little straight line, and it would have a slope. Agreed? Now, how am I supposed to find the slope of a line this long? It doesn't have a y-intercept. Okay? There's no y2 and y1. The length of time over which it occurs is incredibly small. I can't even see it on the graph. How does that help me? It helps me if I draw a tangent. How many of you guys remember that from that? Okay. A tangent is a line that touches a curve but doesn't cross it. That means it's parallel to the curve wherever it touches it. So if I draw a tangent like they have here, that longer line, okay, has the same slope as the curve at that point. Can I calculate the slope of that line? It's long enough. So you cheat. Okay? You can cheat and find out what the slope of that infinitely small straight line actually is. The reason we never ask you to do this is because it involves you to freehand it. Okay? We basically don't do any graphing on paper anymore. And the other part of it is everybody will draw a slightly different but still perfectly valid line and everyone will get a slightly different number, kind of within an acceptable range okay, of numbers there. So it becomes kind of difficult to assess. So all you need to do is understand that a curve is made of many, many small lines, and that every one of those small lines tells you how fast you're going at that point. I'm not going to ask you to calculate it, just that you know it. Okay. All right, questions there? Okay, so being able to read interpret and calculate from a position time graph. That's what you're going to be asked to do. All right? So on like Tuesday's quiz, you'll probably get a position versus time graph okay? and be asked to do some of the stuff we did. Calculate total displacement. Okay? Calculate average velocity. Or maybe do a y equals mx plus d calculation because we'll probably work on that a bit tomorrow. Okay? All right. Um, what have I got? Here. Same picture. Okay, let's see what you remember from y equals mx plus b here. Okay, so the equation at the top here is y equals m times x plus b. Okay, so that's the actual equation for this line. Right. So that graph only goes to 15 seconds. And they want to know what's the position of the object after one minute or 60 seconds. Okay. How would I calculate that? This would have totally been like a math 10C question. And a science 10 question. Would you times 3.85 by 60? And do one other thing. Right, and add negative 0 0.801, okay? So here's, here's how we know to do that. I think that is the right number. Yeah. Okay, uh, so if I'm looking for position, what axis is position on? Y. It's on the y axis, okay. So that means I'm solving for a y value. This is my y equals m times x plus b, okay? They told me what x is, because they said, what's its position after this amount of time, okay? If you're given an x value, that goes in for x. So they're basically asking us, what is y when x is 60 seconds? Okay. So I plug in 60 for x. I multiply it by the slope, 3.85. In this case, 3.85 meters per second. It would be the velocity of the object. Okay. And then I would add the y-intercept, which just happens to be a negative number because it dropped below 
the x-axis. Okay, so I would go y equals 3.85 times 60 seconds plus negative 0 0.801. Two hundred and thirty point two meters positive okay, would be our position after one minute. Okay? Alright. See if you can do number two. Number two is asking how long it's going to take. How long means you're solving for? Time. Okay? How long means time. Okay? How long will it take to reach a position? of 150 meters. Okay, so you're being asked to calculate time, which is on which axis? X. And you're told 150 meters, which is a position, so they gave you Y. Okay, they gave you a Y value. They want you to calculate what is X when Y is 150. 